Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 10 and I'll be reading verses 1 through 14. And this is what it says. Jesus is doing the talking here. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Jesus therefore said to them, again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hireling and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Pray with me. Jesus, this day is a day of celebration, a day of praise because you, you know your own. And we come here to, to grow in intimacy with you, to, to know you. Jesus, in this, this time and in this space, may we hear your voice and see your hand moving among us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I read a story about a weekly faculty meeting at a university. It was the archaeology professor that was the first to speak up. He said he had recently uncovered a lamp from the Middle East. And the words inscribed on the lamp were an ancient language that said that in that lamp contained a genie. Well, it was the philosophy professor that reached over, grabbed the lamp, and just began to rub as hard as he could. That's when, poof, a genie appeared. And he turned to the philosophy professor and said, Your wish is my command. What is it that your wish? Wealth. Wisdom or beauty. Immediately the philosophy professor said, I want wisdom. Poof, the genie disappeared. And the rest of the faculty stood around looking at the philosophy professor and said, Say something, say something, say something wise and insightful. The philosophy professor turned to them all and said, I should have gone for the money. <laughs> You know, I, I think among the most familiar verses in all of the Bible are these verses right here in, in cha John 10, verse 10. When Jesus says, 
I have come that you might have life and might have it abundantly. I think so often we, we hear that, that Jesus came that we might have life. And whatever we want from life and whatever we think from life and whatever we desire from life, that gene, Jesus is the great genie to give us whatever we think, whatever we think we want, whatever we think we need. That's a genie. That's not Jesus. Jesus, true to the... To the to the image that he sets here is a good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives what the sheep need, not what they think they need. The good shepherd gives not just what the sheep wants. The good shepherd gives what the sheep need. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Jesus, the good shepherd. And here we open up scripture and, and, and we look at at how Jesus defines the, the good shepherd. And the first thing that it says in, in verse 3. He says, the sheep hear his voice. And he calls to his own sheep by name. And he leads them out. And he repeats it again in verse 14. I am the good shepherd and I know my own. And my own know me. That it's the good shepherd that, that speaks and listens for the sheep. It's an intimacy with God. That's where Jesus starts. That the good shepherd knows the sheep and the sheep know him. In the movie Shadowlands, it's a movie about the life of C.S. Lewis. There's a particular scene where C.S. Lewis has returned to Oxford from London. In London, he was married in a private ceremony to an American named Joy Gresham. It was a private ceremony because Joy was in the hospital dying of cancer. They were married with, at her bedside. When he returns to Oxford, his friend, an Episcopal priest named Harry Harrington, turns to C.S. Lewis and says, how's the news from London? Well, C.S. Lewis thought about it for a minute and chose to answer about the marriage instead of about the illness. And he said, ah, good news, I think, Harry. Yes, good news. And that's when Harry said, I know you've been praying and now God is answering your prayers. And that's when C.S. Lewis says, that's not why I pray, Harry. I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God, it changes me. Prayer doesn't start with our need. Prayer doesn't start with our want. Prayer doesn't start with me. Prayer starts with, with God. When Jesus was instructing his disciples how to pray, yes, there was provision set aside and instruction to pray for daily bread, but that's not where the prayer starts. So often we tend to begin and end our prayers with what we want God to do for us, as if God were the great genie. But Jesus' instruction says, pray in this way, our Father. It starts with God, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. This, it's, it's a prayer of praise, of holiness and honor to God. That prayer begins with an, an intimacy with God. Bernard of Clairvaux talks about the, the development in, in life. That we all start with a love of self for self's sake. That we want what we want when we want it. And how we want it. But then there's a move, movement in life. Where, where if we're listening, if we're conscious, we move toward God. And very often that first movement is, is not love of self for self's sake. But it's love of God for self's sake. That we love God for what we feel like God can give us. But then he says that's just, just barely Christian that we move then to love of God for God's sake. That it's not a, a selfish intimacy. 
It's an intimacy like C.S. Lewis talks about here. An intimacy that's a, that's a hunger where we can't help ourselves, where the need flows out of us all the time, waking or sleeping. The need for that, that intimacy, not to change God, but that God might change us. This morning, I'm glad you're here. That together, in worship, we might seek an, an intimacy with God. That we might hear his voice. So we open scripture. We might see his hand. So we, we pray, starting with praise and recognizing who God is. I'm glad because Jesus says where two or more are gathered that he's here among us. It's not that we're so good, it's that Jesus is the good shepherd. And we come together to, to seek intimacy with the one who, well, that knows us and we know him. It's the good shepherd. He speaks and we listen. But it doesn't stop there. In verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. It's the door that's the entrance. That's the image that he uses. It's the door that is secure. It's the door that Jesus guards. Several years ago, I was visiting a family that was new to the community. They had attended church and, and had asked, contact from a minister I set up an appointment it was early in the evening and set up a time and I went to their home I started to knock on the door and that's when I saw a, 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 a note handwritten note there on the door it said no monsters allowed well I wasn't really sure if the note was meant for me or not <laughs> and they knew I was coming and just seemed a little curious that they'd handwrite a, a note on the door saying no monsters allowed. And I was trying to figure out, well, should I knock? Should I ring a doorbell or should I go home? And that's when the door opened. And the man kind of had a sheepish look on his face and he, he took the note. And he said, oh, uh, I apologize. We're new to the area and we have a hard time getting our four-year-old to sleep. It's a new house and so we have to put a note on the door, no monsters allowed, and a note on all the windows. That way he feels safe enough to go to sleep. Come on in. <laughs> and then he opened the door, I went inside. That fear, that fear, fear of a new place. Fear of the night. Eh, Four-year-olds, it's a pretty common thing. Virginia Spring wrote to... Reader's Digest many years ago that she and her family were gathered around the television set that Pope John Paul II was flying into this country and visiting for the first time and they were watching TV to, to watch his arrival. Well, his, his plane landed and they, they pulled the, the steps out to the, the plane and when John Paul came off the plane symbolically he kissed the ground and that's when her 80-year-old aunt said, I know how he feels. I hate flying too. <laughs> well, sometimes it's the fear of a four-year-old. Sometimes it's the fear of an 80-year-old. And whether it's a, a pope or whether it's pilgrim, we all have fears. We all have fears. It's the most natural thing in the world to have fears. I know, I know what it is to be afraid. And I think during this time, maybe more so than any other time in my life, that the voices from out there, they, there's something brand new to be afraid of every day. Something that's beyond our control. Something that, that, that you and I can't do anything about except be afraid and it calls us to, to look to our fears, look to our fears, look to our fears, and not just be afraid, but to be very afraid. 
And I'm just like everybody else. I know what it is to be afraid. And even being afraid of the death of the people that I love most, which is, is one of those things just like anybody else. But I also know that it grows. It grows. The fear grows the more I feed it. That the fear grows when I only turn to others. The fear grows when I try and overcome fear by myself. But when I turn to Jesus, the good shepherd, he's the one. He's the one that the, that's the good shepherd. He's the one that's the guardian of my heart and my mind. When I deliberately, consciously choose to turn to the good shepherd and away from my fears, I know there's a strength that Jesus gives. I think this is exactly what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he wrote from jail. Facing not someone else's death, but his own. Facing a future that was not known at all. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the guardian of the door. The door to our heart and of our mind. That he is the good shepherd who makes the doorway secure to our hearts and our minds. The good news is we can turn to him. He's the one that provides the strength. He is the one who is perfect love that casts out all fear. He's the good shepherd. And together, I'm glad that you, you chose. You chose to, to join us in worship. Worship of the good shepherd who has strength we don't have to keep us secure and safe. Jesus is the good shepherd. He speaks and listens in a growing intimacy with God. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the door who, who guards the sheep. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is verse 11. That Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life. And that's exactly what he says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. David McCasland tells a story about a time that he was driving through an intersection and there was a, a car that was stalled. It had the hood up there. It was stalled in the middle of the intersection. The woman flagged him down. He was driving the car. He stopped. He got out, came to her car and she said, I, I can't get it started. But if you jiggle the wire on the battery, I think it'll work. Well, he looked in. He, he grabbed the, the positive cable there on the ter terminal and it came off in his hand. He understood why that was a problem. And she, he told her, he said, well, if you have a wrench, I can fix it. She said, well, that's not what my husband does. He just jiggles the wire, and I'm sure if you jiggle the wire, it will work. Well, he got to wondering why her husband wasn't there following her around all day, so he could jiggle the wire for her. He said, if you give me two minutes and a wrench, I can fix it for good. But that's not what she wanted. She said, no need to do all that. You just jiggle the wire. He said, if I jiggle the wire when you turn off the car, you'll need someone to jiggle the wire again. Two minutes and a wrench. And I can fix it for good. So often I think what we seek is someone just to, to jiggle the wire. Someone to give us a quick fix. But that's not what Jesus did. The good news is Jesus went to the cross. And when he says he laid down, lays down his life for his sheep, he's obviously pointing to the cross. It's the cross that is what we need most. 
that Jesus took all those things that would destroy us. All those things that would defeat us. All those things that would conquer us. And he fixed it for good. He took them on himself and he nailed them to the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might be made right with God. He took all those things that would destroy us and he killed them. He took away their power once and for all and when he rose from the grave, he gave that power to you and to me. Not that we might just jiggle the wire, that we might rub and ask for the genie, that we might grow in intimacy with him. An intimacy that we might have power to listen to his voice. And we might share our own voice as well. That we might follow. That's what disciples do. That's what sheep do. That's what he called you and me to do is to follow. To listen to his voice. And it's not something that we can can do it's a still small voice that requires a choice a choice for us to meet him deliberately in a in a growing intimacy he rose to give us that power the power that we might follow follow him rather than just being chased by monsters he's given strength that you and I don't have. And that strength, it meets us daily. A strength. He rose that we might have strength to follow. To follow. And we might, well, we might have a life dedicated to paying attention to him. This morning, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've chosen to meet, to meet where two or more are gathered that we might hear his voice in the opening of scripture. That we might hear his voice in prayer. That we might hear his voice as he comes to join our spirits with his spirit. That we might know the, the good shepherd. This morning... It may be that you've been chased by monsters for a while. And you've been, been feeding those monsters as you face them. And they've been, not been shrinking, they've been growing. And that this morning, together, we might turn to Jesus in prayer. And I want to invite you to do that. Let's pray. Jesus, this morning, we need it because our greatest need is you. Oh, sometimes we pick out other needs or wants that are really important. They're just not essential. Jesus, grant us strength enough right now to turn toward you and to grow in an, an intimacy where we listen for your voice. In the stillness of this time, we listen for your voice. And we began to give praise. We began to give thanks. We began to, to look and see how it is you move your hand among us. And, and that right now, starting this day, we might have a dedication to paying attention to you. We might have a, a deliberate, conscious choice of listening to your voice. Yes, in scripture. Yes, in prayer. Yes, as, as we meet together. With one another. You died on the cross. Not for a half measure. Not to, to jiggle the wire. But to give us what we need most. A life. A life that comes from you. Full and abundant. Because it's your spirit. That joins with our spirit. And lives in us. Breathe on us. The power of your spirit this morning cast out all fear that we might follow follow it's in Christ's name we pray 
Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.